Minister, um, we see there the extreme conditions that farmer face, farmers faced during the summer. And if I can bring you back to this time last year, some farm organisations were saying that there was a father crisis. At the time, you said that it was a localised issue due to inclement weather. But as the months went on, went on, we had storms, hurricanes, unprecedented snow, and the father crisis ensued. If I'm a farmer and I'm looking at this situation, do I think this is a once off? Or do I think this is a situation where our weather patterns and cycles are changing? And this is a situation that I will have to deal with potentially as the norm from, from here on. And if that is the situation, what is the view of the department on measures that need to be taken to mitigate against this type of situation and emergency measures also? Well, I think we're living with the, the manifestation of climate change, uh, which um, is more frequent extreme weather events. And if you take even since my own appointment in May of 2016, that back end we had the harvest difficulties. We had the flooding in Donegal this time last year in August of, of, of 2017. And we had the long wet winter and late spring, uh, storm Ophelia, snowstorms, uh, and now we've had a drought. So I think that's ample evidence in itself. And I mean, look around the world, we, we, we're seeing multiple similar examples of kind of uh, extreme weather events occurring more frequently. And uh, that's what climate change is about. So I think the reality is we have to, to plan for climate change as uh, something that, that will impact uh, on our uh, daily lives, whether you're a farmer or not. And certainly in terms of farming, um, I think it's clear that uh, provision needs to be made and uh, account taken of the fact that more extreme weather events are likely to occur with greater frequency. And so what measures are the department looking at to deal with this as a long term scenario that farmers will face in the future? Well, I mean, in the context of climate change itself, we, we are signatories as, an, as a state to the Paris Accord. And that brings with it an obligations to deal with uh, reducing our carbon footprint. And, you know, it, it's interesting in that context. Um, many of the steps that are required in, in the context of being more carbon efficient are also proven to be, in fact, uh, steps that deliver greater uh, economic profitability. Um, now, having said that, that's, you know, a part of the, the response. Obviously, there are, um, you know, immediate issues that farmers have to grapple with in the context of fodder provision, for example. And, you know, in, in your intro and, and in, in the uh, clip that we've seen, it has been an extraordinarily difficult time for farmers. I acknowledge that. Uh, I come from that farming background myself. And I mean, it's physically demanding, it's financially challenging, uh, and indeed emotionally and, and, and psychologically challenging for farmers to deal with that relentless, uh, you know, difficulty in, in, in the context of weather. We've had probably, uh, you know, the longest winter and late spring uh, in living memory, uh, and then followed by perhaps six weeks of normality, and then, you know, the current drought. I appreciate it has been, you know, not a uniform picture across the country, but uh, where it has been most pronounced, it has certainly been very, very challenging. And what the department has been doing, I suppose, is uh, initially we convened a stakeholder group, and the purpose of that was to, to look back, and that started its work in early May, and to see what were the lessons to be learned from the previous winter and late spring. But very quickly, the terms of reference for that stakeholder group, which includes farm organisations, the co-ops, the banks, the department, TAGAS, private agricultural advisors, all of the usual stakeholders. Um, the, the terms of reference had to change because very quickly we were dealing with effectively a drought situation. And so the most important work I think that that group, which is representative of the industry, did was tailoring advice to farmers as to how to come through the current difficulties um, and maybe for, in a way parking for a moment the, the look back that's important as well in terms of, uh, you know, what are the steps we need to take? And I think, you know, we've taken a number of steps. For example, most recently announced um, a fodder import package. We've had uh, proposals in terms of the tillage sector to grow more uh, forage crops. We've extended the, the deadlines for the spreading of chemical and, and, and organic fertilizer. Um, so we, we've 
been responding to, to the challenge in a multifaceted way. This isn't an issue that lends itself to one single policy response that will solve it for everybody. Um, and there are, I think, advices available through that uh, uh, stakeholder group, um, particularly led by Taugus and, and, and the private advisory sector, which is really important for farmers in terms of the individual message to them in terms of managing the challenge within their farmyard, because no two farms are, are the same. And, uh, you know, whether you're running a beef or a tillage or a horticulture or a dairy enterprise, the message is, 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 is different and tailored. And I think that really has been in some respects unsung, but really, really important work, the advice that has been given to farmers in terms of that uh, challenge. Just picking you up on that point, Minister, and I know, look, we don't want to look back too much, but I suppose when we look at the timeline that really kind of led us to where we are today, the, the situation wasn't really seen as a crisis until the dairy side, the, the processors announced that they were going to start importing and then it, it added extra weight to the issue. Do you think that's an indication of the influence that the dairy sector has on the agri-industry at the moment? Well, no, and I, I mean, to be fair to the, to the importers, and they weren't all, all of the approved importers weren't just dairy processors, it's important to say. There were other uh, processors uh, and other importers who were non-dairy cooperatives. Um, and indeed, in, in, the dairy co-ops also extended availability of the fodder they imported to non-dairy people. I think that's important because there is, uh, you know, an element of being in this together and we, we collectively uh, navigate the challenge. Um, I, I, the dairy processors are huge uh, economic operations. They are global players and um, we would engage regularly with them. I mean, we would have been in consultation with them long before, for example, we announced the, the recent initiative on imports. And we would have been monitoring the situation through the stakeholder group and through uh, bilateral engagement with all of the partners, including those dairy co-ops, as we did in the previous uh, import scheme earlier this year for the you know the last winter and, and the spring so i mean uh, it's not the case that you know when when the dairy processor says says jump uh, that everybody else uh, pays heed and attention uh, we we engage across all of the stakeholders and all of the industry be it dairy processors or others I understand that, I appreciate that. Um, but do you think that on the dairy side, are the processors more engaged with the dairy suppliers on the ground uh, than perhaps other sectors within the industry? Do you think that there's greater levels of communication um, at the moment, you know, the dairy on the dairy side, there is, you know, extended credit facilities. There is a lot of information out there. They're importing the father. And um, do you think that there's greater engagement, perhaps, on that side of the sector? Well, I think by the, by the nature of it, uh, dairy co-ops and dairy processors have almost a daily interaction with their clients. They're in their yards collecting their milk product um, on, a, on a daily or, or every second day basis. And that level of interaction obviously is close and intense and there's a higher level of awareness perhaps about what's exactly happening in that farmyard that there may be on a cooperative uh, client who might be in the tillage or in, in the beef sector. And they have clients and have extended both the credit facilities uh, to both the tillage and, and, and beef uh, operators as well. So, yes, I mean, undoubtedly, one of the things uh, that points which I made early on to the stakeholder group was that, yes, the co-ops have a high visibility on the dairy side, but it was important through all of the partners, including the dairy uh, cooperatives, that they would reach out to the non-dairy side. And I think in fairness to them and to the other stakeholders, uh, that happened. And, I mean, as I said earlier, uh, the importers of father weren't just the dairy cooperatives because, uh, you know, there were a whole range of other people involved in importing as well that were approved by the department to so do. And that was because of their client base and their reach to others, perhaps non-dairy. Um, and obviously, Minister, you're involved in the beef roundtables. Um, what are the beef processors saying on this issue in terms of mitigating for the future? Well, I mean, it's uh, a challenge for the industry as a whole. Um, and, and the advice is, I think, that we're going to have to 
plan for um, more frequent uh, extreme weather events. And whether you're dairy or not, the, that is a, the challenge is to have sufficient fodder in your farmyard. Whether you're feeding dairy cows or whether you're feeding store cattle or uh, you know rearing sheep, uh, having sufficient fodder is, is, is the challenge. So the advice is critical to farmers. You know, as we emerge from that now, and I appreciate still there are some areas that are significantly challenged by the soil moisture deficit, particularly in the south and southeast. Um, I, I think uh, the message is really important that wherever you can save additional fodder in the country, um, though it may not be for yourself, it's imperative that every effort is made to so do because, yeah, we will import. Uh, but import will only be a small part of the solution. And for example, some of the concessions we've got from the European Commission on glass lands and low input permanent pasture, that will release potentially up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares and hundreds of thousands of tons of potential fodder, which will be far, which will dwarf anything that we will import. So the real message is in the context of the challenge we face is though you may have sufficient provision yourself, Everybody should maximise every available opportunity to harvest additional fodder, whether it's a second cut or a third cut silage, whether it's planting, uh, you know, catch crops in, in, in lands that would otherwise remain fallow until next year's um, spring for, for, for the cereal sector. Um, it's really imperative that everybody, you know, steps forward and, and uh, contributes uh, as best they can to resolving what is a national challenge. Much more so, I would say much more so than it was last year. But on the taking the dairy side as an example, do you think that there is need for better engagement between the beef processor and the, the beef producer on the ground on this issue? Because as you say, we are faced in a, in a new environment where climate change is a, is a reality. These extreme events are a reality that we're going to have to prepare for. So. Is there room there for more engagement um, to, to come up with solid plans, solid measures? Well, I think the, na the nature of the engagement between a, a beef farmer and the processor is very, very different to the nature of the engagement that happens between a dairy farmer and, and his dairy processor. More often than not, perhaps other than those who have producer organization contracts, uh, more often than not, the engagement is, you know, searching for coats for cattle when you have them ready for slaughter. But I do think for the beef sector, it is imperative that they engage with their farm advisor, whether it's Tagusk or others, uh, to, so that they are also availing of the best possible advice. Um, and certainly, you know, the, if the, the beef processing sector want to step into that space, they'd be very, very welcome also. But I think they are very different, the nature of the engagement between a dairy processor and, and remember, most dairy processors are owned themselves through the cooperative structure by those farmers that are supplying them. And that's very, very different to the engagement that happens between the beef sector and beef farmers. On the labour side, Minister, when we're looking ahead to, to the months ahead, the year ahead, um, labour has been another recurring issue on dairy farms. Where do you see the answer? Where is that labour force going to come from to help us get over that, that challenge? Um, this is an interesting uh, area, um, you know, we've just come through a very significant crash. If you were talking a number of years ago about labour shortages, you know, people would have looked at you kind of askance. Uh, it certainly is an issue today and certainly is on the, on the dairy side. Um, we asked uh, Tom Moran, uh, former Secretary General in the Department, to, to work with a number of uh, stakeholders and bring forward uh, a blueprint to address this issue. Part of the solution is work permits. Uh, and I'd like to say that the Department of uh, Enterprise, Employment and Innovation has brought forward uh, proposals for some level of work permits, that is, people coming in from outside the European economic area to work in the dairy industry. Um, but I think there are also other areas uh, where we can find solutions. There may be opportunities, say, for people who are uh, underemployed uh, either on their own farms or, or, or part-time working elsewhere to find opportunities on dairy farms. Um, in other sectors? 
well, who may who may be working um, in in non agricultural uh, employment, but who may, you know, might be able to on on the availability of training and training is a key issue in terms of dairy farming. Who may be available as relief milkers, for example, the farm relief service has an important role to play. Exchange opportunities. Uh, we, we do find at the moment that there is a lot of exchange opportunities between uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. We're not that active in that space, and that's something that we also has been looked at. On the reform of the Common Agricultural Policy post-2020, there has been, we're, we're well aware that there's going to be a huge emphasis on environment. Do you think looking down, looking down the road, will carbon emission output almost become the new quota system for the agricultural sector? Um, I think it has the potential to be that probably. Um, we, you know, we, we have credentials in, in the context of our uh, dairy production, for example, that are by international comparison quite good. I mean, our carbon f footprint for dairy output is, along with New Zealand, probably the best in the world. But is that sufficient to give the dairy sector a, a pass uh, in the context of our obligations that are legally binding now? No. Um, and I think it's not reasonable either, you know, that the expanding dairy sector, and I think it has potential to continue to expand, that it get, can expect others in the agri space to carry out the the sequestration for it. Um, so I think um, the dairy industry will have to do more simple things. Um, you know, the grassland management, grasses, you know, the more we can produce off grass, the more we reduce our carbon footprint. Um, the numbers of dairy farmers that are doing grassland uh, measurement is is quite you know it's it's of, of all sectors it's the highest but it's nowhere near at the level we'd like it to be. Um, milk recording, for example, knowing which cows have the highest somatic cell count, which cows have the highest uh, protein uh, and fats content in their milk, culling accordingly. Um, you know we're not. I I don't believe we have. Uh, the required amount of farmers um, doing milk recording. No farmer really can can afford, in the context of our climate change obligations, to be carrying inefficient cattle. Whether you're dairying or whether you're beef, we need to you know, be constantly improving the genetic merit of our herd. And um, milk recording is a key tool in, in that regard. So um, the dairy sector um, needs to be aware, not least because the market is demanding it, that we need to be best in class in terms of um, our, our uh, sustainability credentials. We've done a lot, but we have a lot more to do. I'm sorry, Minister, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for coming in and joining us on our first edition of Farmland.